Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. And in this episode I'm going to be building Greywall Hobbies P61B in 148th scale. This kit was sent to me by one of my patrons who was requesting that I build an aircraft in black. That was going to make things very interesting for me because I've never done it. Black is a very difficult color to work with, especially on a scale model. Whereas if you just paint it flat black with Tamiya X1, it looks like a toy, so this challenge is a little bit harder than it initially sounds. Before I could get to painting the exterior though, I had to build the kit, and there were a few minor issues on the internals, but for one of Great Wall Hobby's first kits, this wasn't a bad first time out. The only real fit issue I had was getting the windscreen in place, but we'll get to that later. With how large and visible the cockpit and crew areas were of this kit, I decided to use the 3D printer to add some more interest basically to add some gauges that were missing to print some throttle handles slash redo the entire throttle quadrant on the wall and run some wire and some styrene. All of this added together to give it quite a bit more interest. Some of the gauges may not be 100% accurate, but it does give the impression of some more detail. If you're looking for a quick replacement for stock oxygen hoses in the kit and you play guitar, it turns out that your D and G strings make great substitutes. You just have to heat them up to make them malleable. While waiting for super glue to dry, it was time to test some things on the test Tojo to see what my planned attack was going to be for the black. But first let's talk about the P61 Black Widow itself. The P61 was the first aircraft to be designed from the ground up as a night fighter, where other aircraft were modified to carry onboard radar repeaters and small radar sets and relying on ground control. The P-61 was designed to carry its own radar set into the air. When Royal Air Force and United States Army Air Corps requirements closely mirrored each other, Jack Northop hit the drawing board with his team to come up with an idea that would please both countries' air forces. Due to the Royal Air Force wanting a long loiter time and the aircraft carrying a large radar unit, Northop quickly realized that the fighter would need to be at least twin-engined, making it larger than any other fighter that would serve with the Allies. The RAF found that the P-61 was to be too slow to compete with the German bombers and fighters over Europe that it was supposed to be intercepting. Things were at a point where United States Army Air Force General Spatz requested to have the Mosquitoes to replace the P-61s in theater. Handicapped by a speed slower than the enemy, P-61 crews did manage several shootdowns. During the Battle of the Bulge, P-61s were kept aloft in poor weather conditions in an effort to protect the town. When the weather finally cleared, the Black Widows quickly transitioned to a ground attack role to deny reinforcements to the German army. P-61s were also credited with the destruction of several trains and trucks during the Bulge Campaign, a role that they were never designed for. In the Pacific, the P-61 didn't fare much better in combat. Many missions resulted in no contact with enemy fighters due to the great distances the fighters had to travel. But three interesting events in the Pacific involved the Black Widow. The first one, where a P-61 was credited with the destruction of a still-flying but abandoned B-29 bomber. The crew had bailed out, but left the aircraft on autopilot. The second, when a P-61 provided a distraction at the Philippines prisoner of war camp so rangers could get into position to attack without being detected. The third, and most significant, was when the P-61 Lady in the Dark chased a Kai-44 Tojo down to wave top level, where the Japanese fighter crashed possibly being the final kill of the Second World War. Although it was outdated by the end of the Second World War, the P-61 Black Widow had managed to accomplish 120 aerial victories, but after the war ended it was quickly relegated to secondary roles such as training and working with the National Aeronautics Board to discover more information about thunderstorms using its onboard radar, and that led to a lot of the discoveries we know about thunderstorms today. After only 10 years in service with the United States Air Force, the P-61 was retired, and only four surviving airframes remain today. Being one of Great Wall Hobby's first kits released into the market, this P-61 actually isn't that bad of an introduction. The only two negative aspects of this kit is that the landing gear bays for the nasals have no detail at all, and the windscreen didn't exactly fit. There's also a few little areas where you'll need some putty to fix fill things in, but otherwise the kit does go together generally well. 
Just plan to spend some time blending the clear nose into the fuselage, as this panel line does not exist on the actual aircraft. You will... Ooh, what the hell just happened here? After gluing down a strip of styrene to help blend the windscreen, I ended up adding in some Tamiya epoxy putty and blending it with some sculpting tools and water. After it had had some time to dry, I then sanded it down with some sanding sticks. Because the finish of this aircraft was going to be black, that meant that any imperfections in the body were going to show. The trick to filling a step like this is instead of trying to fill it all in one pass, is to gradually build up the putties and filler until you get a nice smooth finish. And also give it a couple days to off gas or else you're going to be chasing holes and other imperfections. After a few primer checks, it was then time to move on to painting the aircraft. And this was going to be a big challenge because the patron that sent me this model kit requested that I build it in black. Because black is one of those colors when you're building a scale model that is extremely difficult to work with. And why is that? Because if you just go to straight to me XF1 flat black, it looks like a toy and there's really no depth or character to the model. And I've never built anything in black. So this was definitely going to be a challenge. And I plan to basically attack that with my usual pre-shading, but by using different shades of black and grays and then blending it with an almost black blend layer. But before I could do any work with the black paint, I wanted to lay the base for some pretty heavy weathering with the aircraft. Most reference photos that I had for P-61s in the Pacific Theater showed them quite dusty, lots of exhaust staining, zinc chromate chipping showing, and even the aluminum of the airframe. So I thought to myself, maybe a good way to offset that harshness of an entirely black aircraft was to bring in as much color as possible just from little things like the drop tanks being silver or extreme chipping on them. But first, I was going to paint as many of the markings as possible. So here comes the silhouette machine, and I decided to make a fictitious aircraft so I could paint everything and not have to worry about using the nose art. Great Wall Hobby's decals are notoriously thick, which would mean a lot of clear coats trying to blend those down. So it was actually easier to paint them in this case. If you're someone just getting into painting your own markings, one tip I can give you now is to paint your lighter markings first and then move into the darker colors. Otherwise you're going to be using a lot of paint to cover the darker colors and you're going to end up with steps in the paint. It also makes it a lot easier to correct any mistakes you may have where you can just come in with a quick shot of primer and restart rather than stripping down paint from the underlying coats. The base aluminum of the aircraft was made with Mr. Metal Color Aluminum and I find that that paint is very durable and it will stand up to a lot of abuse. So it makes a great base for any chipping you're going to do to your paint. Once that had had a few hours to dry, I then came in with some chipping fluid and laid down some very light layers before putting down my zinc chromate yellow. Then it was just a matter of coming in with a stiff brush, wetting the paint and taking some time to chip it away. The nice thing about chipping fluid and lacquer paints is it gives you some very tiny microscopic chips that look awesome and pretty much look in scale. The first step I took for the black paint was to come in with an almost black base and I used Tamiya's rubber black for that. It's a nice color, it's got a little bit of a grayish hue to it and if you just left this color alone you could probably just put some oils in it and have a very nice black aircraft. But that's not how I do things around here. My next step was to then come in with the Tamiya XF1 black and probably put it down so it was nearly completely covering the rubber black. I would say about 80% transparency. And the point of this is that I could still have a little bit of area to go to a complete black and still show a difference in paint tones. If I had to just gone to a straight black, any panel liners or oils would have a hard time covering that. So once I had this black down, I then came in with a very, very thin blend coat of AK Real Colors Russian 6RP Black, which has a slight brownish tone to it. And again, 
I didn't want a full on black color. I wanted there to be some hint of another shade in there. Unlike other colors like olive drab or navy sea blues, I found that this black was very good at killing any lighter tones it was on top of. For example, I tried some Kark Tan, I tried some Brown, and I even tried Cowling Color, which has a very strong blue tint to it. But this 6RP and that XF1 just completely sucked that color out, so it was a bit of a waste of time. So just by using two colors in the black basing, it meant that I was going to really have to rely on the oils to break up that color. Another tip for chipping, if you're having trouble getting the paint to lift, is to use some high grit sanding sponge just to start abrading away at the paint. Because when you really think about it, that's how paint abrades in real life. It doesn't just have someone come along with a brush stabbing at it. It has things like your feet dragging on it, gravel, anything that's abrasive, and it'll start to slowly break that down. We just speed that process up with a sanding sponge. Now that all the airbrush painting was done for the color work, I could then come in and start removing the masks. While I was doing that though, I felt that there still wasn't enough zinc chromate showing through the black, so I came back in with a brush and water and started chipping the paint some more until it felt like there was too much going on. But that's okay, because the next weathering layers tend to push that back. And if you're doing this while you're a couple of beers in at the bench, it's not that hard to repaint it and start again if you've gone too far. Once all the chipping was done, I wanted to bring some shine to the paint, but not be overbearing. So I took a tip out of the Model Geek podcast book, where I believe it's Frillo mentions that he polishes his paint before he goes on to the next stages. So right on top of the paint with no clear or anything, I came in with some Tamiya polishing compounds and started giving that paint a good wipe. I'm not looking for it to look like glass or a showroom finish. I'm just looking for that paint to have a little bit of shine to it. Before moving on to the next step, I mixed some oil paints on cardboard just to start bringing that linseed out of the oils to make it easier to blend and work with so it wouldn't dry with a shine. And then while that was happening, I started airbrushing in the exhaust streaks on the P61. Now, I'm not sure why it's so extreme in some cases pulling back this far out of the engine, but my theory is that the lead and fuel still in the exhaust is being stained with some coral dust that the aircraft's kicking up. Because it looks like P-38s also have that same thing happen, but I was hard pressed to find other aircraft that had that much streaking. But it does play its part in taking away from that overall black look of the aircraft. For the pin wash on this aircraft, I used lamp black because this black is pretty much 100% and it's going to cover everything it's going on top of. And to turn it into a wash, I'm just going to keep adding enamel thinner until it runs freely down the side of the palette. Once it does that, I know it'll run in the panel lines and be easy to remove. This also sets out a sort of framework you can use when you start doing your oil paint rendering and seeing what panels and what areas you really want to accent. I had a few people suggest using a dust wash for this aircraft, being a Pacific aircraft, but on the test Tojo, it didn't look right at all, so I chose not to go that route. Once the wash had dried, I removed the excess using a shop towel. For the oil paint rendering, I basically dip my paintbrush in some thinner, remove the excess, then touch it into the oil paint itself until I get a nice thin blend of oil. It's a little bit thicker than what it is for a wash, but it doesn't entirely cover the paint it goes on top of. This drop tank is completely X1 black from Tamiya, but you can see how those lighter oil paint rendering colors start to break that up. And the idea is to bring that up in different panels, then add other colors and then blend it with a dryer brush. And then you can dry it with a hair dryer. You can also keep repeating that until you're happy with how things look. And if you're not happy, you can just take a shop cloth with some thinner and wipe it off and start again. You can also use different style brushes like Deerfoot stipplers or blending brushes to really break up that paint and get it to do some interesting things. The most difficult part about this is because the paint had been polished a little bit was that it's very hard to get the oil paints to stay in place and blend. This is much easier to do on top of a flat paint so I found myself having to use a little bit of enamel thinner to blend it in. 
To generate some discussion below, why don't you write in the comments section a new technique that you've tried and really had to push yourself to get a grasp on before you were happy with it. Let us know and we'll discuss it and see what everyone has been up to. The best advice I can give from my perspective of building models is I really like challenging myself because it keeps builds from becoming stagnant. If I was just doing the same thing over and over and over again, I believe I'd start to get bored of it and probably leave the hobby to find something else. However, by trying new techniques or trying different mediums, it really keeps things interesting and fresh. And by pushing myself that way, that's how I found that I keep improving with my builds. You can practice all you want and you can learn the techniques, but it's not until you're really challenging yourself that you improve. Now that the black oil work has been completed, it was then time to bring in a little bit of a lighter dust color to make the exhaust streets pop. Now this is the point in the video where I thank my patrons for their support. I really appreciate it. This month has been hard with snow and being on call and missing a lot of time at the bench. However, these guys here really help things keep moving. They get to see things behind the scenes. The 132 guys get to see videos a week early, so they're watching this now. And even at the lower tiers, you still get to see HD photos. I can talk with you. And one of the unique things is I spoke with one of my patrons earlier this week to, to, uh, sorry, to critique one of his models. And I didn't do that in a necessarily negative way. He just asked me for some feedback and I was able to provide it to him. And I know he's gonna move forward with that and his next builds are gonna keep improving. Once again, George, I really appreciate you sending this model. I was a little hesitant doing an all black challenge, but I hope this video gives you the information you were looking for and feel free to use it as a base for you what you're doing and I hope it helps you out. This is the model guy and I will talk to you next time.